but sentient beings harm me. And sentient beings do stupid things, and they're fighting wars, and they're killing each other, and they're making unfair policies that harm other beings. How can I see them as kind? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very easy, you know, for our anger to come up when we disapprove of others and their behavior. So what we have to separate out is seeing that the behavior somebody does and the person who does it are two different things, okay? The behavior, we can say, is inappropriate, is, in, is destructive, is harmful. But that doesn't make the person who does the behavior evil, contemptible, you know, horrible, okay? Why? Because that person has what we call the Buddha nature. They still had the possibility to become fully awakened. So we can't say that they're evil. Yeah, through and through, and you know, a horrible person. Because yeah. somebody who has the nature to become a Buddha can't be a horrible person, otherwise they wouldn't have that nature. Okay? So we have to see the behavior is one thing, the person is another. We can comment on the behavior, but we don't have to hate the person who does it. And that, seeing things like that is very freeing for our mind, yeah? Because then we can just focus on behavior being inappropriate or harmful, but still see the person in a good light and have a kind feeling towards that person. And that's really important because if we confuse the action and the person and then hate the person or are angry and resentful towards the person, then we stay stuck in that bitterness, resentment, wanting revenge, self-pity, victimization mentality. And you grow old with that and your whole life is basically ruined not by the other person's actions, but by our response to their actions. Okay? Because the thing is, we cannot control other people's actions. We keep trying to. We want to make them be what we want them to be. But it's impossible. Yeah? The only thing we can control is our responses to their actions. And that's what Dharma practice is about, is controlling, managing those responses, making the responses more realistic, making them more beneficial, okay? Because hating a person for one action they did is not realistic or reasonable, is it? Like I was telling you the other day when I, that person didn't let me give my presentation to the group and, uh, you know, five minutes of their life and I just thought, oh, I can't stand them. And that's pretty unreasonable, isn't it? To think like that, yeah? And to, to hold a grudge against somebody is also unreasonable because that person's not always doing that behavior. The, the behavior's done, it's finished. Every time I think about it, I'm doing it to myself again. But that's not their problem, that's my problem. Okay? So I have to make my way of thinking and looking at situations more realistic and more beneficial. And if I do so, then I don't have impossible expectations of other people. And I also start have, stop having impossible expectations of myself. Yeah, and so this all revolves around our notion of perfection. I want my situation to be perfect, which like I said before means everybody does what I want them to do when I want them to do it. And I want myself to be perfect, meaning I have this impossibly high expectation of how I should be and look and appear and think and act and you know, I'm not accepting myself for who I am. I'm developing this false image of a perfect me, comparing myself to it, and then saying, oh, you know. 
I, I, I'm a failure. I can't do anything right. You know? But is it realistic to develop this image of either ourself or somebody else that is not who they are? Yeah, that's not very realistic, is it? And it's not very beneficial either, because when we do that, then we compare ourselves to it. Then we feel lousy about ourselves. When we feel lousy about ourselves, our, we sink into depression. Then does our depression benefit any other sentient being? No. Does it cause problems for sentient beings? Yes. Are we happy when we're depressed? No. Okay, so that kind of pattern, <clears throat> it's not realistic and it doesn't benefit either ourselves or other people. <clears throat> yeah, so then you're going to say, oh, but then that means we don't have any goals at all. If I don't have any aims, any expectations of myself, or any expectations of others, then that means anything goes. Yeah, and I don't aim for anything, and then I become, you know, what do we call that? That duh Buddhist, you know, oh, I don't care about anything. I have equanimity, duh. <laughs> I don't have any expectations for myself, duh, so I won't do anything, duh. I don't have any expectations for you either, so you just act whatever crazy way you want, duh. Everything's all okay, it's all perfect as it is, duh. You know, that's not what we're talking about, yeah? Because the duh view is, is equally as unrealistic and not beneficial, okay? So what we're talking about, the middle way here, is okay, in terms of ourself, I have aspirations. An aspiration is different than an expectation. Yeah, very different. I aspire to grow into this kind of person, but I don't expect myself to do it, and especially not by next Tuesday. You know, so I aspire. And like bodhisattvas, they make these impossible aspirations. I'm going to liberate all sentient beings. I'm going to go to the hell realm and liberate all the sentient beings from the hell realm. You know, is that going to happen? No. But having that, expect that aspiration opens the mind to new possibilities. If I expect myself to do that, then I'm going to judge myself against this ex impossible expectation. If I aspire to do that, I'm not going to judge myself. I'm just going to have this open, completely, wow, let's see how far I can go, mind, which invigorates us, which makes us joyful and makes us hopeful and optimistic and actually free of expectation. Okay? You, you getting what, I, what I'm talking about here? Okay? When we stop judging ourselves, then we liberate so much energy because this whole thing of judging ourselves, you know? Am I a good student? Am I a good teacher? Am I a good parent? Am I a good child? Am I a good whatever? This judgment with expectation consumes so much time and energy that could be used in being, becoming this beautiful person. Yeah? And when we have aspirations instead of expectations, we stop worrying so much because we realize that we are what we are. And so worrying about anything is not going to help anything. And other people are what they are. We can aspire to influence people to help them become better in the future, but we aren't expecting them to. Okay? 
So we're not going to judge them all the time. We're not going to worry about them all the time because we realize that we can't control them. Yeah? So all this, this kind of stuff, you know, when we're worried, when we're fearful, that's all backed up by this idea that I am a concrete person who should be able to control the world. Or at least, if I can't control the whole world like Hitler, at least I'm going to control my world. So I'm going to control everybody in my world and make them be what I want them to be because I know what's best for them. <sighs> yeah? That's, that's a big burden to put on ourselves. And it's also a pretty big burden to put on other people. Yeah? That in our discussion group a few days ago, we were talking about lying. And many people commented that who did they lie to was their parents. Okay, why do you lie to your parents? Your parents expect you to be this, and you're not that. And they're worried about you, and you don't want them to be unhappy. So what do you do? You lie to them. Then, does that make you close with your parents? No. Does that make you feel good? No. Wouldn't it be nice if your parents didn't worry so much? Yeah? Now, we can't expect them not to worry. <laughs> yeah, because that's the, you know, what parents do. But if, <laughs> yeah. But if you're going to be a parent, <laughs> then have some compassion for your kid and don't worry about them so much. Yeah, I am the daughter of a mother who specialized in worrying. Okay, if you have any, any knowledge about Jewish families, you know, that is what they do. They just worry all the time, nonstop. Okay, it's a horrible burden on the child, yeah? So, you know, you can have a little bit of compassion. Just, you know, chill out a little bit, yeah? Let, let, let think people be. Don't expect yourself to be perfect and don't expect yourself to control them. See, this is what, what's difficult when you're a parent, is when they're little, you have a lot of control. You can pick them up and make them do things. <laughs> yeah. When they get older, you can't do that. You can't pick them up and make them do things. Yeah. But you still think you should be able to. Yeah. But, but they, they won't let you, and they'll tell you so, as all of you have told your parents, yeah, in one way or another. All of us have told our parents, actually, <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, you know, if we can eliminate the thing about control, eliminate the expectations, and instead have beautiful aspirations, yeah? But not have this thing of, you know, always saying, is my aspiration coming true? Oh no, it's not there yet, what's wrong? Just, I aspire, I'm going towards this beautiful thing, and leave it like that. Okay? Okay, now moving into the topic of karma, okay? We, you know, I started speaking about how our actions influence other people, okay? We cannot control people, but our actions do influence them. Yeah. So sometimes we go from one extreme to the other. Either my actions are going to control them, or I have no influence at all. It, it's not like that. Okay. We can't control them, but we do have influence. So when we care about others, from our side, 
we don't want to do actions that are harmful to them. Okay. Having said that, what does harm mean? Okay. If I do something with a good intention that is actually going to benefit somebody in the long term, but they get mad at me, am I harming them or am I benefiting them? Hmm? You're benefiting them, aren't you? Even if they're mad at you. Okay? Yeah? So any parent will tell you that, won't you? I mean, you have to do things that your kids don't like. All the time. All the time, yeah. You know? It's like one kid's grabbing things from the other, or, or they're behaving like brats or whatever. And you have to say, no, that behavior is unacceptable. Yeah? You can feel whatever you want to feel, but that behavior is unacceptable. Yeah? The child may be furious at you, but what you're doing is benefiting the child in the long term. Because if you don't do that, your kid's going to grow up as a spoiled brat and won't be able to function in the world. Yeah? And I look back now about the way I was raised and many things my parents did when they were doing them, I hated. And I look back now and I realize I'm glad they didn't some of those things because, you know, it made me aware of my behavior. It, ma it made me learn that I, I can't do whatever I want, that I have to take things into account that have to do with other people. Duh! You know? <laughs> that I'm not the most important one in the world, and that I have to learn to deal with the frustration of things not always being the way I want to be, want them to be. And my parents had to teach me that, because if they gave me everything I wanted, then as an adult, I would expect everything to always go my way. When is that ever going to happen in the world? Forget it. So if I didn't learn to deal with my frustration of not getting what I wanted, I wouldn't be able to function in this world. Yeah, but my parents had to bear the brunt of teaching me that. Yeah, by not giving me everything I wanted because it's impossible. Okay, and I would have tantrums. I remember, I can't remember which birthday it was. I was quite young. But my parents had this lovely birthday party for me. And at the end of the birthday, you know, what did I do before I went to bed? I cried because it was going to be a whole year before I had another birthday. Instead of saying, Mom and Dad, thank you so much for what the wonderful thing you did, and I love all my friends for, yeah, you know, and I enjoyed it so much, I cried because it's going to be a whole other year before I'm the star of the show. Yeah? My parents didn't buy into that. Thank goodness. Yeah? If they bought into it and, oh, well, we'll take you out for some fun thing tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, you know, I would be impossible to be, live with. You know? So they, they just kind of said, well, you're sorry, but, you know, <laughs> you're, you're crying, but look back on the day and try and rejoice at, at the happiness you had. And try and recognize that we did something nice for you instead of just thinking always about yourself. <sighs> yeah? So, of course, that wasn't what I wanted to hear when I was six or seven years old. I wanted to hear we're going to Disneyland tomorrow. Yeah, but my parents were actually kind to me. 
So sometimes, you know, to really benefit somebody, you have to do what they don't like. Yeah. Now, how does this relate to people-pleasing? People-pleasing is a whole different ballgame. We can easily get this very confused with people-pleasing. Yeah, Buddhism says to benefit others. That means, and Buddhism says that, you know, I have to take on the responsibility of leading all sentient beings to enlightenment. So that means everything I do should be please other beings and make them happy. And I'm responsible for everybody else's emotions. So if somebody is upset, I'm at fault. Yeah? If somebody else is happy, I did something right. If they're unhappy, I did something wrong. Yeah? This is the wrong way of thinking. Yeah? Other people, if every individual is responsible for their own emotions, we are responsible for our actions. We're responsible for our own actions. We're responsible for our own emotions. We are not responsible for others' actions, and we are not responsible for their emotions because we can't control any of that. Okay? So, if I'm doing something with a kind intention and to the best of my knowledge, you know, what I'm doing, it, I want it to be beneficial, but somebody else's feelings get hurt, because they misunderstand what I'm doing? Am I responsible for their being unhappy? Did I do something non-virtuous? No. Okay. If I'm so concerned, I want everybody to like me, because I'm terrified if people don't like me, I'm terrified if they criticize me. I don't want anybody to, to find fault with me. So therefore, I bend over backwards and do whatever this person wants me to do, even though what they want me to do isn't so good. But they're so happy with me when I do that. And they love me when I do that, even though what I'm doing is maybe doing something illegal, you know, or something that's harmful to a third person, but the person I care about is happy about what I'm doing, then am I acting, is what I'm doing virtuous or non-virtuous? It's non-virtuous, isn't it? Yeah? Because I'm the action I'm doing is harmful. And the motivation I'm doing it with is actually quite selfish, isn't it? It looks like I care about the other person. I want to make them happy. But why do I want to make them happy? Because I want them to like me. Not because I really care about them, but because I'm terrified of getting criticized. Yeah. So I will juggle 15 balls and do 10 backflips and put myself in a dangerous situation. I'll do anything but risk somebody not liking me. Yeah, And that kind of attitude leads us to make very, very poor choices. Yeah, To not see clearly what we're doing but to really make bad choices. So, you know, I, I do a lot of work with prisoners, and they've taught me so much, you know. And, and one of the things that, that they say is, I didn't realize that my actions had consequences. So on one hand, it means I didn't realize my actions uh, influenced other people but they also didn't realize how they're responsible for their own actions. 
And so they'll tell me, well, I'm with this group of guys, and everybody's doing this. So I went along with what everybody's doing. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, so they want to go to a store, and, you know, we want to uh, hold, hold up the store, get a little extra money for our dope. But, you know, I'm just going to sit in the car. They're going to go in and rob the store. And I'll just sit in the car. And anyway, I'm with my friend, and, you know, then we'll go score some dope afterwards. But our friends go into the store, and then what happens? They have a gun. They wind up firing the gun, the other person dies, they jump in the car, I lead them, I drive them away. Under law, you're, you can be tried for murder if you're the driver of the getaway car. Yeah? You don't have to be the person who kills someone. You don't even have to have had the intention to kill to be tried for murder. Okay? Even your friend who just went in, not intending to murder anybody, but just intending to frighten them. Yeah. But then the other person behind the, you know, has a gun, and then they get scared, and, you know, you wind up having a shootout. I know somebody this, hap this happened to. Yeah. And then, okay. But why did we put ourselves in that situation to start with? Yeah, because we're with our friends, and we want to make our friends happy, and we're not thinking about the results of our actions. And we're not thinking, is this action a kind action? Is it kind to steal something from a convenience store? How is that going to influence the other people? How is that going to influence myself? Yeah. If I steal something from the convenience store, okay, the owner of the convenience store is going to be out of some money. And we may shine that on and say, well, they're rich anyway. We don't necessarily know that. But we, we tell ourselves they are. But who's going to be the person who gets in trouble? Yeah. The 19-year-old kid who's behind the counter, who gives you the money, who's terrified because you have the gun. And that kid's going to lose their job. That kid, their whole life is going to be affected by having somebody point a gun at them. I mean, do you think having somebody point a gun at you, that you're going to forget that the next day? Uh-uh. Yeah. I mean, that's going to terrify you for the rest of your life and influence a lot of what you do. But, you know, the kid going in there and doing that doesn't think, how's it going to influence the person behind the counter? How's it going to influence the owner? What happens if, you know, things don't go as planned and I wind up using my gun? What's going to happen to my friend who's in the car who's going to drive me away? You know, what's going to happen to my family if I get busted? What's it going to do to my parents? How's it going to influence my siblings? We're not thinking anything like that, you know? We're just thinking, well, my friends are doing this, and I want them to like me, and there's nothing wrong with it anyway, because the guy who owns the store is rich. It'll, we'll go get high afterwards, and it'll be fun. Yeah? So, you know, yeah, we can see how this attitude of people pleasing, it gets us into a lot of trouble and makes us make really unwise decisions. I mean, I'm giving an extreme case here, but this happens all the time. Yeah? But it also happens in our lives. Sometimes, you know, we make choices and do things just to please people, but it's not a good choice. Yeah? Domestic abuse is another example where this comes up. Yeah? 
you're involved with somebody, you think you love them, you say, I love them very much. They're beating you. You say, well, Buddhism teaches be compassionate. Yeah. So I should forgive him. He's beating me. I love him. I don't want to call the cops. I don't want him to go to prison. I don't want him to get in trouble. Anyway, if he gets in trouble, he's going to beat me more. But I love him, and I don't want to be separated from him. I want to be with him. I just wish he would stop beating me. Yeah, so I'm not going to report him. I'm going to practice compassion and forgive him. And then what's going to happen? Is he going to stop beating you? No. He's going to continue to beat you. Yeah, is beating you creating good karma for him? No. He's creating horrible karma by beating you. Yeah. Then, you know, do you stay in that situation and develop compassion for him? Are you re really being compassionate, letting him create that kind of karma? And what about yourself? Are you being kind to yourself? Yeah. Is that compassionate to yourself to let somebody beat you? No. And especially if there's a child involved. And the child hearing, you know, screams in the house all the time and is terrified because, you know, one parent's beating the other parent. What does that do to the child? Yeah? So, you know, that's not compassion to continue in that situation. And you have to say very clearly, you know, the compassionate thing to do is to say, that behavior is not appropriate. And I won't put up with it, and I'm out of here. But what keeps you hooked in the situation? I love him. Why do you love somebody who treats you like, excuse my friends, shit? <laughs> you know? Come on. You deserve better than that. Huh? And you have to call forth your courage and say, yes. You know? I can say, I don't have to hate him. Yeah, It's not an issue of, I'm going to hate him. But I have some self-respect. And I respect him. And I don't want to see him to continue with that. And I'm not putting up with it. Yeah? Ciao. Bye-bye. Yeah? Okay. It takes a lot of courage to do that. You know, it's usually the woman. I did talk to one man, though. He tried to tell me his wife was beating him. A strange. He was, I don't know, 6'2 or something. He told me his wife was beating him. Anyway, um, you know, it takes enormous courage to do that. But, you know, out of benefiting yourself, benefiting others, and that's real compassion, you know. And again, you don't have to be angry to do it. You just have to look at the situation and say, letting this continue is not helping anybody. Yeah. Okay? So, okay, let's come back now to karma. Yeah? To. Because karma is related in all of this. You know, we're create karma simply means action. It means what our physical action, our verbal communication, or this kind of communication. Sorry, that's old fashioned. This kind of communication. <laughs> yeah, this this is yeah, nobody does that anymore. Everybody does this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, do, I can't do that. Of course, I don't own a phone, so I don't have any practice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. At, so it means verbal communication or physical communication, and it means our thoughts. What kind of thoughts we 
dwell on, what kind of things we think about and plan. Okay? So physical, mental, verbal actions. That's what karma is. And we're doing karma, we're creating karma all the time. Our motivation is the chief factor in determining the, va the karmic value of what we do. And the thing about karma, okay, is our actions. It's, it's a very simple system of cause and effect. There's nothing magical about karma. It's just you create a cause, you get an effect. The thing that makes karma hard to understand for, pe for some people is that sometimes the cause is created in one life and the effect is experienced in another. That's what makes karma hard to understand. But it being a simple system of create that cause, you get that effect. You plant rose seeds, you get roses. You don't get daisies, you don't get tomatoes. Yeah, you plant rhubarb, you get rhubarb. Yeah, you don't get giraffes and you don't get a telephone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, the causes bring their results and that causes bring results that are concordant with the cause. Okay, so the cause, you know, like I just, it's concordant. You plant daisies, you get daisies. Okay, so the cause has to have the ability to produce that particular effect. And effects arise from causes that have the ability to produce them, not from causes that don't have that ability to produce them. Okay? So, you know, when we talk about karma, then the question comes up. Well, you know, the Buddha said certain things are non-virtuous or unwholesome, whatever word you like to use. Other actions are virtuous or wholesome or skillful. There's many different ways to translate it. There's no one perfect English way. Yeah, virtuous kind of sounds sometimes preachy. Wholesome sounds like 1950, you know, <laughs> skillful sounds like you're trying to, you know, develop a, a skill. So none of the words really fit, okay? Um, <laughs> I just stick with virtuous, you know. Um, but you can use whatever word you want. Okay, so the Buddha said, well, certain actions are virtuous and certain are not virtuous. So how come? Yeah. Did Buddha invent this? Are these the Ten Commandments of Buddhism that the Buddha established and told us, thou shalt not do these ten and thou shalt do these ten? No. Okay, Buddha did not create the system of ethics. What the Buddha did was, because he had this ability, his mind was free of obscurations, he could see things that normal people could not see. So when sentient beings experienced happiness, he was able to look at what were the causes that created that happiness. And he labeled those causes virtuous. When sentient beings experienced suffering, he was able to see what causes created suffering for sentient beings. He called those actions non-virtuous. So virtue and non-virtue are merely designated in relationship to the kind of result they bring. Okay? So Buddha did not invent this system. You can, there's no sense being angry at the Buddha, <clears throat> you know, because he said, that, you know, thou shalt not do this and that, because the Buddha didn't say that. The Buddha never said, thou shalt not. The Buddha said, if you do this, just realize you're going to get this result. And if you do that, you're going to get this result. So you are an intelligent individual. I'll teach you how this works. But then you're responsible for making your own decisions. 
because I can't control what you do. So I'm laying it out, how it works, and then you think about it. And you think about what you want to do. And you think about what kind of results you get, you want, and then create the causes for the kind of results you want, and don't recreate the causes for the kind of results you don't want. It sounds very simple, okay? <laughs> what makes it difficult for us is, like I said, the results often come in a future lifetime. But even when we get immediate results, like I was talking about with these guys in prison, the guys don't even think of the immediate results of their actions. Yeah? It's just so momentary. What's the pleasure I'm going to get right now? And the rest of us are also completely overcome by that mind that says, I want what I want when I want it. Yeah? I want my pleasure now. I don't want it 10 minutes from now, let alone in a future lifetime. You know, we're so completely focused on now and on my pleasure that we're blind to the big picture. Okay? What makes us blind is attachment to our own pleasure and aversion to anything that displeases us. So at the root of this whole thing is there's a concrete me whose pleasure and happiness is the most important thing in the world. So any time I can get even the tiniest bit of pleasure, I'm going for it. And any time I can avoid even the tiniest bit of pain, that's the chief thing I want. But we're evaluating pleasure and pain not in the long distance, but now. Or very close to now. Okay? So I, it came up in our thing about lying, you know? I don't want somebody to scold me. I mean, this is why I lied to my parents. I, I hated getting scolded, and I didn't want to have a scene. I hated when they yelled at me. So I don't want to avoid that. I don't want to have that displeasure. So I lied. Yeah? Yeah? Don't tell them what they don't want to hear. Hmm? Very easy. Then I have more pleasure, no pain. But then, karmically, I have the imprint of lying on, on my mind stream. Okay? Yeah. Our parents is a very difficult situation. That, that one's very sticky. Maybe sometimes it's easier to think about an employer. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you brought that up, lying, you know, having to lie at work. And many times, I mean... People, especially when I go to Singapore, they tell me, well, my boss did everything but tell me directly I had to lie, but they made it very clear to me that I'm supposed to lie to, you know, get the business deal, to protect the company, to whatever it is I'm supposed to do. Okay, so then you feel that pressure. I don't like to get scolded by my boss, and I don't want my boss to be mad at me and fire me so I'm going to lie. Now that's interesting. You don't get fired for lying, but you might, you, you're afraid of getting fired for not lying. That's strange, isn't it? Something's wrong. <laughs> Something's really wrong. If we're afraid of getting fired, if we're not lying, but we're not afraid of getting fired if we lie. Yeah. But the thing is, if you lie and the lie's discovered, you will get fired. Yeah. But at that moment, it's like, 
well, what to do, you know? I gotta protect myself first. So it's really quite difficult there, yeah? And I often, I'm, I'm often surprised that, because I just think like, if an employee came to me and said, I'm being asked to do something deceptive and I don't think it's good for the company and I care about what happens to this company, I would say, wow, that's a good employee. They have some loyalty to the company. They care about the company. They're not just caring about themselves. I should listen to them. That's what I would think. Yeah. And I had a friend. She was an executive with Levi Strauss. And uh, this was many years ago. She got tired of the business world, and now she's a massage therapist. But, but then she was, you know, she was a, she had her MBA, and she was, you know, in the business world in Hong Kong. So talk about stress. And I asked her about that, you know, about lying to con, to con, uh, your clients and your customers. And she said, if you lie to clients and customers, they eventually find out. Then they don't come back to you anymore because they don't trust you. Yeah, and they also won't recommend you to anybody else. If you are honest and fair with your clients and customers, they will trust you and they will come back and they will recommend you to other people. Yeah, so in the long term, it's better for your, com your company if you're honest. And this is just even talking about the company's reputation and the company making money, you know, which are worldly goals. But she's saying, even in terms of your worldly goals, it's better to tell the truth. Yeah. Yet it's, it's so hard when you're in the position because it's like, well, that worldly goal is a little bit far out. I need to protect myself right now. Yeah. But then I ask myself, you know, and I ask people when they tell me this thing, like, I can't say anything. I said, do you want to work for a company who lies? Yeah? Do you really want to work for people who lie? No. But I can get another job. But wait a minute. You're a talented, creative, intelligent individual. Surely you can get another job. You know? Don't you think? So it's quite interesting how that works. Yeah. Of course, I don't know from experience because I don't work. Yeah. <laughs> so they can't fire me. They just don't show up. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, when I really think about it, you know, because the thing is, we have to live with ourselves. Yeah, when we go to bed at night, you know, we may have lied and deceived and cheated and put on a good impression for all sorts of people, and they may have fallen for all our shenanigans. But when we go to bed at night, we're there with ourselves. When we die, we're there with ourselves. And we, we have a feeling about you know, is what I did okay or was it not okay? And what is more important, feeling good about yourself or getting praised by other people, even though you were doing it for a rotten motivation? What, what's more important, our own sense of integrity and self-respect or pleasing other people even if these people are unethical, are doing something unethical. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me how much we are slaves to our reputation and slaves of um, being praised and avoiding blame. We're completely enslaved by that. You know, 
as if reputation was the most important thing in the world. But what is a reputation? It's what other people think. It's only other people's thoughts. Now, think about other people's thoughts. Are their thoughts reliable? Well, if they're anything like us, are our thoughts reliable? Are our opinions reliable? No. So if their thoughts are anything like ours, they're probably just as reliable or unreliable as ours. Second of all, even if they think I'm wonderful, does that mean I'm wonderful? Well, one part of us says, yes, that's why I want them all to love me. <laughs> but if you really think about it, does somebody think, somebody thinking we're wonderful make us wonderful? Does somebody thinking we're awful make us awful? It's just their thought. Yeah. And thoughts are ne not necessarily true. They're just mental energy. Blip, blip. Okay. Third thing, are we so important that other people are going to think about what they think about us all day long? Is that going to be the chief thing they focus on all day long, is I like so-and-so and I don't like so-and-so? I don't think so, because I think they're going to be too busy thinking about themselves to care much about me. Yeah. But I have to live with myself. Yeah, I have to live with myself. So I need to be able to feel comfortable with what I've done. Because hmm? when I die, you can have everybody else around you, praising you, saying they love you, but that's not going to send you to a good rebirth, and it's not going to make your dying peaceful. Yeah? So we have to, you know, Learn to be comfortable with ourselves. Yeah. I think that's really important to live a life with integrity. Yeah. So, in brief, the kind of actions the Buddha told us to look, look out for. Yeah. To, to really think carefully before we do, is first of all taking somebody's life or harming them physically, you know? Why? Because everybody cherishes their life as much as we cherish our life. Yeah? Second thing, you know, also phys we, physically, is, um, you know, to check if we really want to do is take things that haven't been freely given to us. Yeah, that can be called stealing, but sometimes it's, it's helpful to say taking what hasn't been freely given to us. Yeah. And to really think, do I want to do this? Third thing, unwise and unkind sexual behavior. Yeah, so what does that mean? That means if we're in a relationship, going outside our relationship, or even if we're single, going with somebody who's in a relationship. Doesn't matter, married or not. It's, you know, whether you're in a committed relationship. Why? Because when somebody does that, it creates a mess in, in a relationship. And especially if kids are involved, I mean, it's just a super mess. Yeah, because eventually the other person finds out. Yeah, just ask John Edwards, ask, you know, uh, any number of people. Yeah, what was that guy's name? Was he from the IMF? Some, some French guy, remember? Some real big, remember? 
somebody Strauss or something. Yeah, anyway, you know, who, who, um, who had sex, yeah, in New York with the, somebody who was working at a hotel. Oh, yeah, your French, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, some kind of irresponsible use of sexuality, yeah. It can also mean, I think, you know, if there's a danger of sexually transmitted diseases, not using um, <clears throat> condoms or whatever you need to use, because that can adversely help some affect somebody else's health, you know? That's not kind use of, of sexuality. And also, I think, just using people emotionally, yeah, I mean, not using people sexually, allowing them to become emotionally involved with you when you don't really care about them, yeah? So this whole thing of hooking up, it seems like, well, we're just hooking up, nobody really cares about the other person anyway. We're just two animals sleeping together, getting our own pleasure. But I wonder, I wonder, yeah. So, yeah, just to monitor that. Really, the other person doesn't care at all after they sleep with you? It's as if you're a total stranger? Sounds strange to me. Anyway. But, you know, I'm with the dinosaurs a little bit, so, yeah. But I'm also a little bit practical, you know, because my generation was the generation of, oh, yes, let's have open relationships. Yeah, oh, yeah, really, let's have an open relationship. And then, you know, my friends would have open relationships, you know, and it's like, this doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds really good in theory. But in practicality, it doesn't work very well. No. Okay, so, yeah, so those are the kind of things, Phys three physical actions. Then four verbal ones, lying, you know, saying what is, isn't, or what isn't is, yeah. Um, using our speech to create disharmony, talking behind other people's back, wanting to ruin their reputation, wanting to cause trouble between two people who are harmonious. Okay. Then harsh speech, ridiculing people, yelling and screaming, insulting them, berating them, making fun of them, teasing them, tormenting them by teasing them. Okay, people do this one all the time. I mean, actually, the four verbal ones are like rampant. And then uh, the, the last of the verbal ones are idle talk. Just blah, 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 to people who actually could be using their time in better ways, and we could be using our time in better ways. Talking about things that don't really matter, but just create more and more afflictions. So, you know, talking about, about, you know, where to score some good dope, where, you know, talking about the gossip behind the latest politicians, talking about, you know, the sports teams and this and that, talking about where to get things on sale, you know, on and on and on. Just, I mean, we talk about so many useless things, okay? Then three verbal, uh, three mental things. So coveting other people's stuff. So you walk into people's house and your mind starts thinking, looking at their stuff. Wow, that's such a cool thing. I wonder if I can get them to give that to me. Yeah? So coveting, you know, planning how to get stuff for ourselves. Then um, malice, planning how to get even with somebody. Yeah, we really don't like somebody, and we sit there and just think of how much we don't like them and how good it's going to feel to get even. Okay, and then wrong views, kind of thinking, well, 
you know, and here we're talking about really kind of cynical wrong views. It's impossible to get enlightened. Sentient beings are inherently selfish. Enlightenment is possible. There's no such thing as the Buddha Dharma Sangha. You know, my actions don't bring any results. I can do what I want, and they're not going to. My, my actions don't have any ethical dimension at all. Okay? So these kind of wrong views. Yeah. And actually, the wrong views, it's interesting, even though they're just mental, in one way, they're the worst of all ten. Because when we have wrong views, then we do the other nine. Because we say, oh, it doesn't matter. There's no result. Yeah. Okay. And so those are the ten things the Buddha said. They're non-virtuous. So really think about whether you want to do them or not before you do them. And, you know, just not doing them is already something virtuous. Yeah, so there's a situation. You could smash this insect. You don't. You take it outside instead. There's this person. You feel like punching him in the nose. You decide not to. Yeah, just abstaining from these things is already virtuous. Plus, doing the opposite. Yeah, telling the truth. Using your speech to create harmony. Using your speech to encourage people to do what good. Using your speech to point out their good qualities, their virtue. Yeah? Using your speech to help people be harmonious. Okay? So, do, so restraining from those ten and then doing the opposite. Those are all virtuous actions which bring happy results. Some of the happy results are in the, this life. Many of them will be in the future lives. Yeah. But, so, so we say, well, future lives, I'm not sure that they exist. Anyway, that's going to be another person, so it's not me, so who cares? But then what happens when we experience suffering in this life? What do we do? Ah! <laughs> this person hurt my feelings. This person is sexually using me. This person cheated me, you know, cheated me when in our business deal. This person, you know, spread bad rumors around me. Ah! Why did this happen to me? Yeah, when we experience suffering in this life, yeah, we always go, I'm just sweet, innocent me, you know, I didn't do anything. How come this is happening to me? How come it's happening to me? Because I created the cause. Either earlier this life, or I created the cause in a previous life. And there's the con a continuity between who I was in a previous life and who I am now. So what I did then influences what I do now in the same way as what I do earlier in this life influences what I experience later in this life, even though I'm not the same person later in this life as I was earlier in this life. Like just recently, there was one, uh, one German man, this happened in the last few days, who he had been a Nazi guard. He hadn't directly put people in the gas chamber or shot people. You know, he just was the one that took away their possessions when they arrived at the camp. But he knew very well what was going on in the camp. He, he was now 94 years old. He's this old man. You know, he did this like 60, 70 years ago, probably 70 years ago if it was in the 40s, yeah? But he, he knew what was going on in the camp and collaborated with all of it. 70 years went by, now they're putting him in prison, yeah? 
So if we think that, that, you know, it's a good example of, I mean, you look at the picture of, they had one picture of him when he was in his 20s and the picture of him when he was 90s. You wouldn't recognize this as the same person. But we can see there's the continuity between the, who he was in the 20s and who he was in the 90s. And he's responsible for his actions. Even though he's 94 years old, he's still responsible for the actions he did when he was 20-something. And he's experiencing the result of those actions. And nobody thinks anything about that there's anything weird about that because they see the continuity. So similarly, actually, you know, from one life to the next, there's the continuity, the consciousness, you know. The continuity of consciousness goes from one life to the next, even though there's no soul that goes from one life to the next. So what we do in one life, we can experience the results of in another life. Okay, We all are going to be eating food today. Yeah. Did, did you take precepts? Yeah. Well, good for you. So, you know, we're all going to be having lunch today. Do we ever ask, why do I get to eat lunch today? And there's several million people on this planet who don't get to? <laughs> we don't ask that question. Yeah, when we're suffering, why me? When we're happy, we don't say, why me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But why do we get to eat food? Because we practice generosity in a previous life. We help share what we had. So this lifetime, you know, people share what they have with us. Okay. So cause and effect, it works. It operates from one lifetime to the next. Okay. So we're the ones who, who choose. And in that way, that's one of the ways in which we create our own reality depending on the choices we make. And that's one reason why we're so fortunate to have met the Dharma and to even hear this teaching so that we can start to think about our actions and start to think about how do I make wise decisions. Because if you don't hear this kind of teaching and your mind is just overwhelmed by the thought of my happiness now. I want what I want when I want it. Then all our decisions get made by that criteria. And that leads us to create the causes of a lot of suffering. Yeah. So having heard this, te this kind of teaching is incredible fortune because it gives us the possibility to now shape our lives, this life and future lives, to be what we want them to be. Yeah, And it gives us the, the power and ability, you know, to, to change our mind and to learn how to, you know, hold our sense of our own self-respect, our own ethical integrity. And that will make us feel a lot better about ourselves this life in a, you know, and certainly future lives. And it'll also help us clear away all this kind of guilt and remorse from dumb things we've done already in this life. Yeah, so instead of growing old with all that stuff going, you know, it's like we do purification and, you know, we purify, we put this stuff to rest. Then we go forward in our life with enthusiasm and aspiration and good intentions. Okay. So, we've gone over time, but we have four minutes for questions. <laughs> questions or comments or whatever. Yeah. I'm curious about the Buddhist view on homosexuality and 
transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, because I think I've read some places where that's explicitly called a non-virtue. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, like, how cultural is that? And in order for Buddhism to really catch on in our country, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of like, the way views are changing, especially with young people, and how negative reaction we have to like the church being explicitly homophobic and yeah and just how that is all coming together that I just okay yeah. yeah so the buddhist view on sexual ethics mm -hmm. and transgenderism and so forth like that okay so um <clears throat> The Pali canon doesn't say anything particular about it, okay? In the Mahayana tradition, Vasubandhu, who lived in the fourth century, you know, in his writings, he set out different kind of things. And from what he set out, it certainly appears, you know, it, it, it's very homophobic, okay? But it also... Uh, it says don't do things that many heterosexual couples do too, okay? So I think, <clears throat> and most of the Westerners I talk to, that this kind of thing is very culturally conditioned. Because, for example, in ancient Indian culture, it was completely fine to go to a prostitute. And unwise sexual behavior was somebody else pays for the prostitute, but you sleep with her. <laughs> That's unwise sexual behavior. Excuse me, <laughs> but that does not fit, you know, I mean, that doesn't fit our society, does it? You know, I mean, prostitution is, please don't blame the prostitutes, yeah? So I think a lot of this is culture. In, in Tibet, you know, it's interesting. They, they had, in order to keep property in a family, many brothers would marry the same woman. So they, they practiced polyandry. No. Yeah, not poly, poly, polygamy. polygamy, but polyandry, okay? And again, in our culture, that would be a no-no. Yeah. So I think a lot of this is really culturally uh, influenced. And Buddhism certainly talks about accepting people and welcoming people and feeling equanimous towards everybody. Different cultures have, I mean, Buddh Buddhism has, has this this equanimity that is just so marvelous. But the cultures it exists in are often homophobic and, and patriarchal, okay? So we have to separate the culture from, I think, the point of the Dharma, yeah? And certainly for Buddhism to catch on in this country, you can't be patriarchal and you can't be homophobic and you can't discriminate against trans people. Okay, so personally speaking, I think a lot of this is, is culturally determined. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think the book I've been on the shelf called Something About like Buddhism and Sexuality and Gender that I picked up, and it made reference to certain like Buddhist traditions, ancient, well, that practice homosexuality as like part of the... Yeah, Jose's article on that, I, I don't know, that's some obscure... Point. I haven't heard that anywhere else oh, okay. except <laughs> except there. <laughs> yeah. Towards one thing or another. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the way, the only way I think you can explain it. Yeah. yeah. Is some kind of karma from previous lives. I have a really interesting article recently, which is be very quick, but about um, Native American culture, mm -hmm. and the Basque they used to refer them to refer to them as two spirit people, and I thought that I found that really interesting. Huh. That idea of like, you know, they're embodying, they're in one body, but then their whole incarnation is in another. Mm. I thought that fit sort of with the Dharma in a way, like that you can have a physical outward appearance 
and be and different I, inside. Different yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But actually, then everybody is two spirited, <laughs> isn't it? You know, if one spirit is your body and the other one is your own mind, then everybody should is that way. <laughs>